thank you for listening to my commercials. And now we're going to um, go into our program. I'll start with a little introduction um, called Perspectives on the History of Landscape Design in the Hudson Valley. In the 19th century, the Hudson River School artists, such as Thomas Cole and Frederick Church, and landscape designers, such as Andrew Jackson Downing, Calvert Vaux, and Frederick Law Olmsted, planted the seeds of a national identity through their works in the Hudson River Valley. This presentation is an introduction to this historic cultural landscape and some personal perspectives on the local and regional efforts to preserve this heritage. And our speaker is um, Harvey K. Flad. He is Professor Emeritus of Geography at Vassar College, um, a former chair of the Geography and Earth Sciences Departments and founding member of the American Studies, Environmental Studies, and Urban Studies programs. Dr. Flad's scholarship has focused on cultural and historical landscapes and environmental and urban planning. He has published numerous articles on 19th century landscape design theory and practice, including the influence of the Hudson River School of Art and the work of Andrew Jackson Downing, as well as legal testimonies on the visual and aesthetic impact of various development proposals in the Hudson Valley and the Finger Lakes. He has a much longer um, biography that I, I, I am not going to share with you now, but I'm sure you can find it by looking him up on, on the internet because he is a man of uh, great scholarship and has a distinguished curriculum vitae. But now let me turn the program over to Professor Flad, and I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Cynthia. Uh, you know, I forgot Cynthia, to introduce I, myself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we, all right. Can, we, can you all hear me now? Yeah. Um, all right. Um, and I just want to say thank you to uh, Clinton Historical Society for uh, this uh, opportunity to uh, uh, talk about some of the uh, work that has been done in the Hudson Valley in particular, but also elsewhere in terms of historic preservation, but particularly about landscapes, cultural historical landscapes. And uh, we will, uh, uh, I will offer some uh, 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 work that has been done, uh, that has in, uh, been the, uh, the results, of, which have been the estates uh, landscape uh, along the Hudson Valley, that is a historic and national uh, corridor, the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area, for example, which includes all of this. Much of this has been done in the Hudson Valley that is uh, the precursors for what has also been done elsewhere in the, in the country. So I think we have a lot of work to do on that. And also uh, some of the projects that have been uh, worked through the State Environmental Quality Review Act and how uh, the visual impact and aesthetic impact questions have been uh, used to uh, preserve these landscapes. So if we can um, move to the next uh, slide, and this will be the way in which we will work this one out and uh, is that I will ask Kathy to uh, move the slides along. To begin with, the Hudson River School uh, of Art uh, it has certainly brought to the national and international part of the idea of the aesthetic in the Hudson Valley. And it was very important in, in a number of ways, one of which was that uh, Thomas Cole and his the other artists that followed him were very interested in a nationalist uh, uh, aesthetic, one in which the United States and the development of this new country was different from the European aesthetic. And as we see, he, he was also, as you can read on the screen, a, an environmentalist. He was one of our first conservationists, you might say, because he was 
so interested in the in the wilderness, but he he knew that it was being eliminated, destroyed. And so, as he says, the ravages of the axe are daily increasing. And what is called improvement, which as yet generally destroys nature's beauty without substituting that of art. And th therefore, we have to preserve not only the wilderness to some degree, but at least the view and the, uh, the, the aesthetic itself as a nationalist uh, friend group. Next, please. No. The, uh, Andrew Jackson Downing uh, follows in that, um, that aesthetic by creating the romanticized, what we would call a romantic landscape, a landscape in which the the wilderness is being domesticated. So it becomes a domesticated landscape in that sense. Some even say that he would be perhaps um, the earliest uh, uh, landscape architect of 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 uh, suburbanization, <laughs> perhaps with the lawns and so forth. But that's that's going a little bit too far. Um, I would Andrew Jackson Downing. Um, born and raised here in the Hudson Valley. He had his own horticultural nursery in Newburgh. And in 1841, he wrote and published the treatise. It's called a treatise uh, on, for, on landscape gardening for North America. And it's uh, it was the most important and famous uh, of the books that were uh, used as workbooks for both architecture and, and certainly for property management. Next, please. Um, the the uh, the uh, um, Downing and in the in the eighteen forties, as as he was uh, writing this book, in fact, uh, just before the publication of the book. He traveled up the Hudson on the on, on this east coast here of the, of the river and uh, went to both Montgomery Place and eventually to Blythewood, uh, which was uh, uh, Montgomery Place as one of the important uh, estates of the Livingston family. The Livingston uh, properties uh, were all uh, along the northern Dutchess and southern uh, Columbia County uh, shoreline. Uh, Clermont, for example, was the home of the uh, Livingston family, but all properties to the um, south of and then north of Clermont also were, were uh, uh, by the Livingston heirs. And uh, by um, the 18... Uh, uh, 30s and 40s, some of these estates were really quite uh, extraordinary. Um, and Downing, in his travels, um, went to uh, both Montgomery Place, as they say, and, and Blythewood. Um, he visited the area and declared, quote, here's a, one of his quotes out of, out of uh, the, the uh, 1841 edition of the treatise, in which he had both of these uh, drawings, by the way. There is no place in the Union where the taste in landscape gardening is so far advanced as on the middle portion of the Hudson. He was particularly impressed by Montgomery Place, where he opined, for it is as a whole nowhere surpassed in America in point of location, natural beauty, or the landscape gardening charms within its exhibits. And uh, he was equally impressed by uh, Blythewood as well as the landscape gardening of Blythewood. Here in both of these uh, 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 illustrations, we see, for example, in Blythewood, you see the, um, the woman and, and child sitting in, and observing the Hudson River and the Catskills in background 
with a few flowers and so forth, the trees there, a portico and so forth, making the landscape not only romantic, but also very domesticated in this way. The Montgomery Place uh, 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 illustration shows the uh, the portico on uh, the west side here, which uh, with a view of the Hudson again. Uh, Montgomery Place itself as an architecture was was uh, th these pieces of the art of the exterior uh, were done by Andrew Jackson Davis. A.J. Davis uh, worked with uh, A.J. Downing in and uh, drew many of the architectural forms in uh, the subsequent uh, editions of the treatise and in other books as well. Davis was a very famous arch. He was an architect, whereas Downing was not. Next, please. Uh, the landscape uh, design uh, aesthetic that that uh, Downing was most uh, in, famous for, and in, in with respect to uh, presenting this in the treatise, is known as the beautiful and the picturesque. And these two drawings, although very small to, uh, for you to see, but were on the same page in the in in the in the treatise, uh, show uh, the the upper one uh, is of the beautiful, and. Um, Downing would um, describe the many uh, pieces that re reflect a beautiful landscape. For example, uh, the trees are rounded forms. So you have deciduous trees and rounded forms. The architecture is more formal, federal or cla classical in one way or another. Uh, it might have... Uh, um, certain uh, little uh, fountains or flower pots and so forth, and a curving, a curvilinear approach to, to the building with, in this example that you see here, of a woman and a small child, a, a daughter, as a matter of fact, in, in, in dress. And contrast that to the picturesque, which is the bottom, part, which where the trees are um, angular, like pines and, and and other conifers and so forth, or scraggy in certain ways with broken limbs and so forth. And the building itself is a Gothic revival uh, style with the peaked roofs and brick and other kinds of things. And, uh, dor dormer windows and so forth, and uh, per uh, perhaps a, a picturesque, a little uh, gazebo on the property as well. And walking, and you can, I'm sure you cannot see this uh, because it's very dark in, in the illustration itself, as a matter of fact. But uh, this uh, is the, uh, is a male and he has a dog with him. So what we have, and remember now, I taught at Vassar College, right? A good feminist institution. And so we can make a feminist approach to these as well as an aesthetic approach uh, to, uh, to that. The, um, in Downing himself, uh, besides the treatise and other volumes, he became the editor of The Horticulturist. The Journal of Rural Art and Rural Taste. And in that journal, monthly journal, uh, would be uh, essays and so forth uh, about uh, projects that could or should or were being uh, uh, done. And uh, he was that editor throughout uh, his uh, uh, short life. Next, please. No. Uh, no. No way. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, um, in uh, the uh, in 1850, uh, Downing uh, decided to uh, go to England to, to uh, look at the landscapes that were there that were of landscape designers that he uh, uh, wanted to emulate. 
such as uh, Capability Brown, Humphrey Repton, and so forth. And uh, he, he went to those estates, uh, traveled around uh, all, all through that area, uh, and in, at the end met a young, 20-some-odd-year-old uh, um, Calvert Vaux, who was an architect. Now, as I said, Downing himself was not a, a great architect. He could do some drawings. So he invited Vox to come back with him to, uh, to America to be uh, his partner, really. And, and so he did. And Vox came back uh, in, uh, this is now 1850-51, uh, back to uh, the Hudson Valley and, at, um, and worked with Downing in Newburgh uh, at Downing's uh, studio and, and nursery and so forth. And um, eventually, uh, after Downing died in a tragic uh, uh, a steamboat accident uh, in <clears throat> 1852, um, uh, Vox took over and then began to publish some of his own work, which was very similar, very similar to the treatise in the various uh, pattern books uh, that were now being created. Now, this is his most, uh, one of his first was Villas and Cottages. Next, please. In that same time period, 1850 to 1852, uh, that Vox and uh, and Downing are working, uh, Downing was uh, asked by Matthew Vassar uh, from Poughkeepsie, New York, who we all know. Um, Matthew uh, Vassar, uh, uh, was concerned about the, the need for a rural cemetery uh, in, in Poughkeepsie. It was all the rage. Uh, Mount Auburn in 1837 had already uh, made the idea of the uh, rural cemetery uh, very important for any uh, progressive city, as he would say. And uh, uh, Vassar uh, wanted to have one himself, uh, have Poughkeepsie have one itself. So he purchased a, a, a property, the old Allen Farm, here, and you can see uh, on the left um, Academy Street, and uh, this is where Springside exists today. Uh, and uh, in the south part of the city of Poughkeepsie, just off of uh, Academy Street, and this was a, a a map drawn as to what the plan was for Springside by 1852, 1853, uh, and so forth. Um, you will see, and and who uh, both Vox and uh, Downing worked on this. Um, and the reason that he made this into his ferme or nay, his his uh, his ornamental farm, was because. Uh, he couldn't sell any properties, for, uh, any any grave sites or whatever, for uh, for the presumed uh, uh, rural cemetery, and the rural cemetery itself was created right across the street, really across Route Nine, um, South Road, um, uh, and had a view of the river. So the rural cemetery took off, and and is now even now. Uh, the uh, mar marvelous, magnificent, uh, uh, romantic style uh, out of the Mount Auburn style. Uh, Downing would have actually um, done work on it if he had survived, but he uh, he died in 1852, as I say, and so, uh, but Vox continued to work on Springside. Springside has its ornamental farm to the to the west, as you see on Academy Street, and then as you go further east, you uh, uh, you get into the the farm area. Um, next, please. Um, and so this is the uh, ornamental farm area, having both a beautiful, beautiful and picturesque uh, uh, aesthetics uh, landscape parcels about it. You can see the the placing of the trees and uh, in 
certain clumps and then in longer areas. Look at uh, circular, uh, the, 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 the circle, as it were, uh, in, in the center, more or less, of, 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 of the uh, a pictorial view here uh, and making it into very definitely a, a, a more beautiful area. And then you get into some of these clumps of area. If you think of the wilderness, either at, at uh, Montgomery Place or the wilderness in Central Park. Uh, this, this is that Vox uh, and, uh, and, and Downing approach. As you come further east on, on these uh, lovely cur uh, curvilinear roads, you get to the gate where you would go into the, either into the farm or you would uh, turn to the north and there is the cottage uh, area that would be. Uh, what is left on this, uh, from this, is only the gatehouse. If you go to the uh, Academy Street and you will see the gatehouse, we will show some uh, pictures of some of that. Next, please. Yeah. <coughs> um, one of the reasons I got into the, uh, into the, the uh, Springside work and, uh, so early on is because uh, Ma Matthew Basser. Uh, did keep the drawings that Downing did for Springside. Uh, this is extraordinarily uh, important in terms of landscape architecture history, that in the archives at Vassar College, we have original Vox, uh, original Downing and some Downing Vox uh, drawings for this landscape. This was the landscape, the last complete landscape that uh, Downing uh, can be referred to, uh, and it has some of the only uh, extant materials. The carriage house drawing here was then uh, also in the horticulturist in uh, in 1851 when he uh, 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 when he was still there. He, he, so he did some of that. The documentation is very. Very true on that. So next, please, and uh, we'll see other drawings. Um, this is of the gardener's cottage, which is no longer extant. Neither is the carriage house, by the way. Uh, and uh, this gives, it was a small cottage, relatively small. It's actually pretty large if you go over and see the footprint at this point. What's left now, uh, this is the, the, the back elevation or, or west elevation, you could say. Uh, and is uh, just some rubble of, of the foundation. On the front elevation, or the east elevation, um, uh, the uh, uh, two-thirds of that front part, including the, the doorway and uh, the uh, window uh, and uh, the little porch there and the uh, gable, has was cut off and transported to uh, uh, People's Hi Island in uh, uh, by the Department of Historic Preservation and, and uh, Parks and uh, Res Recreation of, of New York State, and now is uh, in the New York State um, uh, 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 not library but um, museum in Albany on the second floor. So you can actually see actual pieces of, uh, of the uh, cottage. Next, please. Um, um, Matt, when, when Downing died in 1852, uh, uh, Vassar had, had four paintings uh, done of, the, um, uh, of, of Springside and by a man by the call of uh, an artist by the name of Henry Gritton. Uh, he was English, but he was he was practicing in New York City at the time, and, and Vassar got in touch with him to do <coughs> paintings of the site and of the landscape. In this one, we can see uh, we can see in the in the back in the mid ground is the uh, are the barns, as well as in the foreground, and in the in the background uh, uh, is the, the cottage itself, and then moves off to uh, the hills in the background. Next, please. <clears throat> and this is a, a much uh, 
one that you will see uh, very often and uh, illustrated. <clears throat> and it is the back view of the cottage. Uh, it's one of the best examples of, of uh, illustration of, of the cottage that we have, besides some photographs that were done earlier. And off to the right um, of the painting are the barns. <clears throat> this is uh, called uh, uh, Cottage Avenue, and uh, uh, going into the, the, the back of the cottage, uh, we see a woman, uh, the cook, more than likely, because the uh, cook was down there, uh, uh, the uh, kitchen was in the basement there. Uh, <clears throat> in the front is a, a farmer and a small child, and they're on their way to <clears throat> the, the barns. Uh, in the foreground is, are some sheep uh, and some um, exam uh, uh, hemlock trees as well. Uh, the hemlock trees uh, that still exist on the uh, <clears throat> on Springside um, are the ones that were planted here by Downey. Um, the sheep, uh, and it's called Deer Park as well. There were no, and, you know, the uh, idea of the lawnmower had not yet come along. But this gives you a pretty good, uh, you know, example of what the site was and uh, how you make how Downing mixed uh, the uh, picturesque and the beautiful. Next, please. <coughs> and, uh, uh, and this is uh, to say that the gatehouse still exists and the gates still exist. Um, um, and uh, I call your attention to that because that is docu uh, uh, real documentation that we have uh, from the paintings to the current day. Um, the uh, <clears throat> Springside, uh, there's a long, quite a history of what happened to Springside after Downing's death and after Matthew Vassar's death, I mean, after Matthew Vassar's death. And, and uh, it went through a, a number of families and properties and um, eventually was uh, purchased by a developer uh, who uh, and was to be condominiums uh, on the site. Uh, a small group of uh, citizens got together uh, and uh, tried to stop the uh, planning and the development, uh, and eventually, um, although, uh, uh, although they were having a difficult time in, uh, in the courts, they, uh, nonetheless, uh, um, the, uh, uh, head of the, uh, small group, uh, John Mylot, who some of you may know, um, uh, met with the developer, uh, you know, one of these, uh, off the, the kitchen table table kind of talks, and they came to a an agreement, and the agreement uh, left the twenty acres of the forty acre parcel uh, to the north, which is the historical part, which includes the gatehouse and includes uh, all that or ornamental farm area and so forth. Um, to a, a, a nonprofit which was established for this purpose called Springside Landscape uh, 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 Restoration. And uh, it is a landmark, uh, one of the earliest of landmarks, actually, 1969, and um, is, uh, continues to uh, exist with a nonprofit group of, of uh, of volunteers who uh, uh, clean the area and cut the, uh, the secondary trees and so forth and so on, keep it available for uh, pub public use. As well, it is a private, of course, but it's uh, for public use. Uh, that's one of the number of, uh, uh, of victories, I would say, uh, historic preservation victories of landscapes uh, that um, I would like to call your attention to that I was involved with as well as uh, some very important uh, uh, 
good, active folks. Next, please. And um, it is one of a number of examples of, of volunteer efforts to, to uh, preserve uh, the landscapes and architecture in the Hudson Valley. The uh, um, Hudson River Heritage, which was established in 1975, as you see, uh, set about placing many of the estate properties on the National Historic Register. Uh, in 1979, they organized the Hudson River Shorelands Task Force, which linked them together as the, quote, 16-mile National Historic District, which was the longest district, uh, historic district in the United States at the time. I was the executive director at the time. And uh, this pulled all the, um, the Livingston estates uh, uh, in, together into one historic district. Later, the Clermont Historic District and the Olana uh, <clears throat> Scenic District uh, ex uh, expanded boundaries to become the largest national historic landmark district in the nation. In 1980, the task force hosted a tour of the district for the second International Conference on National Trusts, co-sponsored by the National Trust of Scotland and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And both uh, uh, the, even those uh, uh, sites were, were then part of this long tour and so forth then. Um, now, uh, among the many, uh, as, I, as you can see, uh, of Livingston family estates, Montgomery Place, Rokeby, Edgewater, Wilderstein, and so on. Uh, and uh, the photo on your left is of Wilderstein, um, which uh, not only is, uh, uh, as it says on the bottom, 1852 by uh, uh, the architect with Arno Cannon here from in Poughkeepsie, uh, but uh, the landscape plan was done by Calvert and Downing Vaux. Calvert Vaux and his son, Downing of Vaux. Um, and uh, it is now also a nonprofit of its own, Willisheim Preservation, and part of this uh, from uh, the wonderful uh, Daisy Sookley, who was indeed a wonderful, warm person. Next, please. Now, Vox, uh, at the, um, uh, in 1852, when, when uh, Downing died, uh, Vox stayed in Newburgh for another a year or so. And um, he did a number of other uh, landscapes and, and uh, architecture homes and so forth in, in and around Newburgh and so forth. Uh, but then uh, went to New York City, where uh, he and Frederick Law Olmsted uh, got together and they won the, uh, the uh, uh, RFP, we might say, for, the, for Central Park. Uh, the Greensward Plan, 1857 to 1858, which we see here, uh, is a classic Downing, Vaux, and now Olmsted type of plan. Uh, Olmsted and Vox would go on and uh, for many years working together, sometimes apart, sometimes back together again. And there are many, many, many parks that are known as the, the Olmsted uh, legacy uh, throughout the United States. Um, in the Boston uh, Emerald Palace and so forth and so, uh, and so forth. But Central Park is... Uh, of an extremely good example of this, as well as Prospect Park in New York for the kind of thing. Downing's legacy is here as well, because Downing had written in The Horticulturist a number of times about uh, the need for public parks. And he was very concerned about democracy and, and civil uh, efforts and so forth, and getting people uh, having uh, working together in community. And uh, parks, nature, and uh, so on were uh, of utmost uh, concern to him to, uh, for, for, especially for people in 
the cities. The cities were teeming at this point, uh, many immigrants and so forth coming in and uh, creating by the 1870s and 80s. Of course, we know that uh, New York City and many others were. So this, these were the, uh, the, the lungs of the city, if you will. Next, please. Also, at that time, this is now just before 18, before the Central Park itself is uh, built, it, um, it was uh, Bryant and his, um, I'm sorry, um, with um, <clears throat> the, um, who was the editor of the New York Pearl Tribune and who um, was, uh, who continued to write about uh, the idea of parks in New York City. And he was um, uh, also talk, uh, 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 getting, trying to get citizen action in the city when, uh, and uh, when, um, uh, Thomas Cole died. He, uh, Asher Duran, one of the Hudson River School, uh, painted, painted his uh, a painting of the two of them on a prospect overlooking probably Catskill Creek, which is where uh, uh, Cole did some of his work in 1848. And it was a, a, a match of Coal, as we saw at the very beginning of this talk, to the idea of the, the mid 20th century now and into the uh, later 20, uh, 19th century uh, of uh, uh, bringing nature to the citizens. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. Cole's uh, um, uh, favorite uh, pupil, really, uh, was uh, Frederick Edward in Church, who um, uh, was uh, uh, becoming very famous, became really uh, uh, the leader of the uh, Hudson River School of Artists uh, by the later the mid, I would say, and then uh, later a part of the 19th century, uh, one of his most famous paintings was that of Niagara Falls, 1857. This painting, which is that down at the Met, maybe many of you have seen it, it is extraordinary. Um, he, um, people would pay, you know, 25 cents or something to go see it. Uh, you want to use very spe specifically to see it. And, um, so uh, church became relatively wealthy as a, as a result of that. Um, and um, it was uh, that uh, because Niagara Falls itself was under threat, uh, Olmsted and Vox actually worked on the Niagara Falls uh, uh, reservation, uh, preservation project. And, uh, and that was really very, very important. But and so a church himself then becomes um, someone that is uh, very important in, in both uh, preservation itself and historic preservation, but also in terms of uh, landscape uh, uh, preservation. So if we go to the next place. With the money that uh, um, he would earn, he um, would build Olana, his historic site, which I have a photograph coming up. Um, but um, it uh, uh, became the site, really, of what the most famous, important uh, uh, environmental um, uh, 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 concern really in in, uh, from a, in a country in, in terms of um, really you would call it the beginning of the environmental movement in many ways 
uh, in the Storm King case, uh, in which the uh, um, uh, the the mountain itself would be defaced by a project by Con Ed. We'll say that in a second, um, and the concern of it was many of many different directions. The concern about the river itself, the fish in the river and the atmosphere and so on, but particularly the defacement of the mountain. A, a scenic treasure would be uh, part of the problem. So if we have the next slide, please. Uh, Con Ed um, was, would build a hydroelectric power plant uh, on Storm King Mountain, as you see, and it would uh, um, take the water intake from the river and bring it up to the top of the mountain, and then the water would come back down uh, and turn the generators and so forth. But the amount of water uh, that it would intake, but also the defacement of the, of the mountain itself became a very important question in in the case brought by a group of nonprofit uh, volunteers who eventually became uh, Scenic Hudson. Next, please. Churches um, Olana uh, is a, a quite an, uh, interesting, I hope all, all of you um, have indeed been to Olana to see the architecture, which is quite uh, eclectic, and certainly it is, um, uh, and quite marvelous, as a matter of fact. Uh, the some of the initial design was sketched by uh, Calvert Vox, as as well as some of the initial uh, scratchings for uh, the landscape. But uh, it's really a, a work that Frederick Church himself is primarily. Uh, uh, responsible for, along with I, the ideas, obviously, and the kind of concepts, conceptual planning, and so forth of uh, of uh, Calder Vox and so and others. Um, it's the view from Olana, which is the important part of the of the preservation of Olana today. Let's have the next photograph, please. The view from uh, the porch at Olana, southwest on the Hudson River, and you can see all the way down the, the Hudson River and in the uh, distance, a, a point of land that, that comes out. And it was on that, in that area very specifically where a nuclear power plant was uh, uh, planned. This is 1978, 79. Um, and... Uh, the uh, opponents to the nuclear power plant proposal <clears throat> were many and many different problems, of course. Uh, uh, nuclear plants would have as being nuclear efficient and so forth, and the atmosphere, uh, and uh, but also like Storm King, the drawdown from the river, killing of the, of the striped bass and so forth, all of that was a, would be a problem. What is the major problem, and why we're talking about it with respect to Frederick Church, is that it would have been directly in uh, the view of uh, uh, the artist um, Frederick Church from Olana, which was at, uh, at finally, at that point, and now, is a... Uh, <coughs> Historic site, New York State uh, uh, Historic Landmark. Next, please. The uh, <laughs> opponents for against the uh, Grand County Nuclear Power Plant um, included. Uh, I was uh, the, there were two uh, of us who did different testimonies uh, about the the scenic and visual impact. Uh, the drawings that 
uh, we were able to do uh, included the one at Fermenten, which was the cooling tower and the plume as seen from Germantown or from Route 90 or from indeed um, from across from uh, from Olana itself. And uh, the secondary site was in uh, Athens or Athens, uh, which <coughs> would have been a cooling tower, which uh, really uh, overlooks the entire village, if you can see on the, the uh, photograph, uh, the simulated uh, view at the, at the bottom. Next, please. Uh, the church's view, uh, he painted church's view in this in this painting, Hudson Valley in the winter, um, as directly from his studio, that is like from the porch, or from his studio was right there. <laughs> and um, it was, uh, if you look directly down there, the, the uh, <clears throat> cooling tower would have been seen uh, very far, as well as the plume, five mile plume off of that. And it was this painting, as well as all of our other documentation, next please, which eventually <laughs> stopped uh, the uh, nuclear power plant from being built and uh, saved the view from Olana. Another aspect of uh, the importance of Olana uh, and Frederick Church is uh, his, uh, his landscape plan himself. And, and you can see uh, his uh, comment <coughs> about <coughs> making more and better landscapes in this way than by tampering with canvas and paint in the studio. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the idea of landscape design along with landscape scenic viewing is a totality of the aesthetic. Next, please. After the Green County Nuclear Power Plant proposal, which is you can see down there on the lower left, there was another uh, attempt to uh, uh, mar the scenic view from Olana, and that is uh, of <coughs> the St. Lawrence, the construction of the St. Lawrence cement plant in 1999, uh, which is 20 years after the Green County Nuclear Power Plant proposal, 1999. And um, you can see uh, Olana in the center of this drawing, this map, and to the northeast uh, was the SLC, uh, uh, St. Lawrence cement plant, what it meant. Uh, this drawing from Scenic Hudson uh, shows the impact, where the <clears throat> visual impacts would have been. Next, please. <clears throat> And here's a, a uh, simulated uh, uh, view that we had in our testimony. Uh, and you can see in the distance, both the uh, plant itself, <clears throat> which was very tall, and, and the, uh, the plume as well, uh, off to that. Um, and and uh, next, please. Uh, next, please, yeah. Um, and the view, a simulated uh, proposal of the uh, facilities necessary for loading and unloading on <clears throat> the waterfront of uh, Hudson, New York. <clears throat> so, and this, this view from Athens shows both the barges that would have been picking up the, the uh, <clears throat> cement and also the big industrial site. Uh, the uh, uh, St. Lawrence cement plant proposal uh, was was defeated uh, very much on the, from, from this kind of scenic view <clears throat> because Hudson uh, had already 
created its comprehensive plan and its waterfront revitalization plan in which it, it uh, was moving in the direction of tourism, which is where it is today, and that was the economy. And uh, the uh, DEC commissioner recognized that and uh, decided that uh, the uh, plant as seen here, the facilities of the plant would have completely uh, uh, been a, a drag on tourism for the uh, for for Hudson and for the Hudson Valley, as a matter of fact. Next, please. This all comes down to uh, what um, is uh, known as visual impact analysis under Seeker, and um, that has now, from the, the 1980s, uh, uh, emerged into what is called community character. Uh, community character, uh, as it says, relates not only to the built and natural environment of a community, but also to how people function within it and perceive the community. And this uh, decision that has uh, the decision on community character for the next project I will show you just brief, very briefly is um, what has now become the definition for community character <coughs> under Seeker and uh, is a, a powerful understanding of how aesthetics is an important issue with respect to how we define ourselves, our, our understanding of our sense of place. Uh, next, next, please. And the, the, there are uh, two examples of this most recently uh, <clears throat> that uh, I have been involved in. One is uh, the uh, at the Seneca Lake uh, Vineyards. Uh, Seneca Lake itself uh, was a, uh, a proposal to build uh, a gas storage facility on the uh, shore of Seneca Lake, right in the midst of the vineyards. The vineyards and uh, winemaking and so forth is a major draw in the Finger Lakes for their tourism and their economy. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the and, and this pr pr proposal was eventually defeated on that, on those grounds that that uh, it would industrialize an otherwise rural and uh, agricultural and uh, tourism uh, environment. Next, please. And the one I'm working on right now, as <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, is also in the Finger Lakes, uh, with, uh, on the same on, on a similar but not the same. Finger Lakes uh, gas storage was, of course, about a proposal, just like the Green County nuclear power plant and the St. Lawrence cement, uh, or proposals to build. In this particular case, the landfill exists. Some of you may have read uh, articles about this in the New York Times, full pages uh, about the uh, fact that uh, this <clears throat> mountain um, and that can be seen from everywhere. In this case, it's viewed from uh, the Seneca Lake, pristine Seneca Lake and uh, of the mountain itself. The, the question is, uh, should it be, should the Seneca Meadows landfill operators be able to continue operating for another 15 years. Uh, their permit uh, is due to stop in, in uh, 2025. So only uh, two years from now, well, almost a year from now. So uh, the opponents are uh, 
suggest making the case that it already uh, not but even though it still exists uh, and we have had it for 30 years we have lived with it we have done our responsibility to the state uh, of the smells and the uh, the garbage and so forth uh, it is time for it to stop and uh, as they say enough is enough and uh, we have to move on and develop as it in order to develop our tourism capacity and uh, and the quality of life there's health issues cancer issues all kinds of issues <laughs> but uh, it's time for it to uh, to stop we will see if that uh, our arguments uh, uh, are are full uh, but as I say it's it's become national as well but this is a scenic view, among other things. It's, an, it's a change to the landscape, which is enormous. Uh, and uh, that is, has a, a, a real effect on, that's not just an aesthetic effect, has a real effect on one's understanding sense of place and quality of life. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, I, I'd love to have some uh, questions uh, in our Q and A if we have some time. We definitely, first of all, want to thank you, Professor Flad, for a wonderful trip from the beginnings of the landscape design movement here in the Hudson Valley right up to the challenges that our landscape is facing today. I um, I hadn't expected you to do that, and I'm delighted <laughs> that you did, because <laughs> I think it makes it much more interesting and um, and vital to our to our current issues. So thank you for I that. I wanted to make it relevant. That's right. It's <laughs> <So I'm just, laughs> pretty, well, you know, yep. it's foundational. But. Yep. What is the word community? The, the with community impact. No, there was a better word for it that you had. That, community character. Community character. Right. I think that's important for all of us to remember. Those of us are in Clinton. I think are are working very much every day to preserve our community character right. and to enhance it. And it's one of the things that makes makes this town very uh, precious and, and livable for those of us who are here. But, um, let's see if there are any, any questions from our assembled audience. I have oh, go ahead. Yes, please. You ever had a... Hi. Hi there. I ever have a thought of having a fundraising event showing the Hudson River School paintings on, for display? bring collectors of those paintings in to show them at the creek meeting house yeah yeah if we could <laughs> i think that well, would be the, uh, uh, the springside paintings <clears throat> as i say there are four of them the Vassar college has three two of them <laughs> are on uh view in the francis limit of art center um, and uh, it's, uh, I'm very, very excited about that because they were lost for a long period of time. And uh, uh, the college was able, uh, they were able to find them and the college uh, get access to them. And they are now hanging. As you go into the, uh, the uh, gallery, on your left, the galleries on your left are the Matthew Vassar uh, collection of uh, his work, but also of the uh, many of the paintings that he had collected for the opening of Vassar College, the first uh, female college, but the first college to have a, a working art gallery. Too. And uh, so it's, uh, and 
uh, these are there in one of the three of the galleries. Yeah. So the the idea is to gather together some of the the downing or the what paintings or watercolors to to do an exhibit at Creek Meeting House to benefit. Is that the idea? The, the Hudson River School artists. Like for example, I have two Asher Durands. I've got a oh G. H. McCord collection, which is very much Hudson Valley. I've got a uh, well, it goes on and on and on. But I think that that would be a very nice attraction. I think it would be too. Can I get in touch with you, maybe after? Other, other, I wanted to ask a question, Harvey, about the relationship of Springside to the cemetery development. I mean, mm -hmm. somehow I remember there were, were there two competing cemetery developments going on at the same time that, well, <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. that was, there was something confusing about that to me. Right. Um, and indeed, to some degree, they were they were competitive. Uh, <clears throat> it really st it started with with Vassar's um, idea. Uh, you know, he he uh, uh, so that the newspapers would say, you know, uh, uh, this is a, a great idea to have a, a rural cemetery now. To, uh, and uh, Vassar went ahead by himself. There was a committee that was formed. Vassar himself went ahead and purchased the, the property, which we now call Springside. Uh, but it, the other members of the committee um, were not all that excited about that particular site. And so they sought another site. Oh, okay. Is the current rural cemetery, uh, which um, was, uh, and it was. Uh, in many ways, it was the better decision uh, in, in terms of the estate property that they were able to get, the <clears throat> amount of acreage that they were able to put the different properties together. And, uh, uh, and at a reasonable cost and so forth uh, by the, uh, the property owners and so forth. So... Uh, it, it just sort of fell that way. And uh, and Vassar was not all that <clears throat> terribly upset. I mean, he was upset to one degree that, you know, it didn't happen in the way he wanted it initially to be. But then by getting, you know, he just said to Downing, okay, let's make this into a, a, a into my summer estate or whatever, you know. My rural, because uh, he lived in, uh, you know, in the center of, of Poughkeepsie on Vassar Street, really uh, downtown, <clears throat> and um, he would write in his in his uh, his diary. As a matter of fact, uh, later, one once they had the cottage built and all that, and he would <clears throat> he would spend a lot of his summertime there. And he, he, he wrote, well, you know, it's a lot cooler here because of all the trees. <laughs> so he, well, there was a there was a, a mansion, a big house at the center of Springside also, right? No. No. Not. not um, there was a mansion that was proposed on the sort of northern edge. Uh, and in fact, one of the, one of the uh, drawings that we have uh, is a uh, drawing by, uh, I think it was by Vox, maybe the initial drawing by, by, by Downing, um, of this mansion. Uh, and it was indeed a large mansion. But um, Vassar didn't, he didn't get very excited about that. So they never built it. Oh. Uh, and that's why he, he just, it, it is called a gardener's cottage, that's true. But he actually <laughs> spent his time in, in okay. there. Okay. <clears throat> and, um, uh, you know, the, uh, 
the gatehouse, of course, I had someone living in it and uh, that kind of thing. So there was other other places to be, but uh, uh, so he no he lo he loved the uh, um, I guess the intimacy or whatever of the of the garden of the garden scholars. Oh, great. Are there any any other questions? We have we have some questions in the chat. Oh, Kathy, good. Um, Barbara, do you Barbara Sweet? Do you want to read your question? Hi, Harvey. Barbara oh, hi, Sweet. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Um, because we've got such beautiful views, both from the east and the west side of the Hudson River. Okay. Uh, is anyone anything anyone doing any work at trying to preserve them okay being that um one way you can preserve uh, the view is use earth tone colors okay instead of white and yellow but uh grays beige greens that will blend in with the background if you're going to put up a building so is there anything in any of the um, documents that are zoning and planning and comprehensive plan that uh, ask towns to make sure that they do use those type of colors if they can be seen from across the river? That is a very interesting question. And I, uh, <clears throat> and I will say, that um, all all the municipalities now have uh, local waterfront revitalization plans, LWRPs. There's water, Harvey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greg. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I do not know of any that have design review in them. Um, we, you know, here in Poughkeepsie, there's been on and off again uh, uh, ideas of having a design review commission. But that is, uh, it is not true, uh, although uh, there is no, so therefore, except for signage, there's always a signage law or something in, in all of these comprehensive plans and so forth. So I don't know of one. Uh, that would do that. Uh, color is a very interesting issue. Uh, uh, Downing himself was uh, uh, made it very clear in the treatise and other places, that, uh, and the horticulturists and so forth, that uh, he was very much against uh, the New England white color because it stood out too much. His colors, like you see at the gatehouse now, uh, you, you can drive by or go to Springside, uh, the colors were environmental. The colors that you just mentioned uh, were to uh, to move the the property, the the architecture, the building, the structure, whatever structure, uh, more into into nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, so the, you know, the muted yellows and 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 browns and and things like that uh, were very. Uh, he he made it very clear that that was very uh, uh, not the white, which was of course the federal colors, you know, of the 1830s and so forth, of the more formal uh, architecture. Um, now uh, there is uh, there are you know uh, as I mentioned the Hudson River, River uh, 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 historic area, cultural area, which includes both uh, the West Bank and the East Bank uh, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, so that it is possible that uh, municipalities on the West Bank as well as on East Bank uh, could uh, uh, have those kinds of concerns in the, either in their planning departments or their zoning or, or uh, comprehensive plans I don't know of them that exist with respect to color. Uh, the, I'll just say something about LWRP at Poughkeepsie because I was involved with writing 
uh, and am on a committee that deals with that, is that we have individuals uh, on the Waterfront Advisory Committee, which is able to offer, uh, can't regulate, but it can offer uh, to the planning board, which does regulate, our, our concerns about, particularly about facade design, roof design, and all of that. <laughs> and so, um, and that is, uh, we have uh, a number of examples <clears throat> in which uh, we have been successful in uh, getting the architects and the developers to realize that if they do something good, they'll make a profit, <laughs> okay? And uh, and they will, um, so that's important. And, um, one thing I've always said is that Poughkeepsie is not going to be Yonkers. We're not going to have the buildings right on the waterfront. And you have to have public access, and it has to be aesthetically pleasing as well. Thank you. <laughs> Kathleen Blake, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Um, okay. First of all, thank you so much. This has been an, just a great presentation. I've been to a lot of the places that you spoke about tonight. And as somebody who has um, a smaller property here in Clinton, I was wondering two things. One is what part of these amazing landscapes that you've been talking about tonight is your favorite? And secondarily, do you think that the average homeowner could incorporate some of these incredible landscapes, even in smaller properties here in Clinton? That's a beautiful question. And the reason is, uh, yes, I do have a, a favorite. My favorite, I think maybe it came through, is Springside. Uh, and it's, uh, and, and uh, one of the reasons is, is that Downing's, if you read Downing's books and get, uh, and so forth, you will see that what he was most interested in were small properties uh and so his designs for those properties uh, uh, uh are you know of cottages and so, so forth he, you know, vox's book cottage and villas for example yes they did villas yes they did big estates they made you know part of their money out, out of doing all of that and indeed uh large landowners uh uh it was very important in the 19th century to have a really good landscape on, uh, and <laughs> and a 20 room uh, mansion. But uh, he, the reason he's sort of called a follower of, of the of the suburb is that the, you know suburbs are small properties. They're domestic domesticated landscape. Uh, he he was very interested in in, in that in terms of citizenship for a democracy. He, he uses those words all the time, democracy and so forth. And he, what he means by that is the small landowner and, and so forth, as well as, of course, uh, uh, some of the rich folks who are paying his freight. But uh, so the plans and, and many that came after him uh, were of that kind. A.J. Davis, on the other hand, I have to say, uh, his architectural work was almost entirely for large, large structures, um, but that's okay. I mean, he, uh, uh, but it was Downing who had the theory, as it says, theory of landscape design for North um, that uh, was about the question of uh, um, being a, a for, a, for the democratic system of the United States. So uh, that's why I like Springside, because it's relatively small. Yes, it was, uh, yeah, it's maybe larger than your two and a half acres, but uh, it is, uh, it is of course, uh, 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 larger than that. But it's, um, but the cottage and, and so forth, it all fits together. Like, a sm uh, you know, a relatively modest, um, home site. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, thank you. Last question from Elliot. Oh, I just had a yeah, quick question here on Springside. How yeah. long was it occupied? Well, you said, of course, Matthew Vassar, and then there are people who came after him. So, how no. many was it? How many? For how long was it actually functioning as a residence, as opposed to what came after that, which you talked about? Yeah, um, I do have the history. I've written the history of uh, what came uh, both Springside and what came after him, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and. Um, in, uh, also in Osmond River Valley Review um, uh, a couple of years ago. And um, the uh, the short sort of answer to that is that the, the <clears throat> three or four families that held on to, the, the property itself was divided into three parts or three siblings of, of the, the next uh, and they more or less kept it together and and they did keep it together pretty well uh and in fact uh the cottage itself was lived in up until the 1950s uh, up until uh actually later in, in, in the 50s uh and uh when uh when they passed on and and so forth and the heirs didn't really I don't want to deal with it. It fell into disrepair, right? And that a, a uh, <clears throat> developer purchased it, but he he kept, he had a a groundskeeper uh, who who stayed in the gatehouse. Now, over the next decade or so, as an abandoned building. It, uh, you know, vandals broke in and did various things. A uh, hole in the roof meant the rain came through and things like that. And uh, eventually, uh, as well, it's always beginning to really deteriorate. The barns, the same thing. Uh, and then um, the barns uh, were completely bulldozed down. Uh, um, Ada Louise Huxtable wrote about that, and uh, I have a, a, a her uh, her quote in, in my uh, article about that, uh, where she said, "You know, it, it was a great national <clears throat> national disaster, right?" And uh, it's a wonderful uh, piece by her on that. Um, so, uh, but it was at that point then. That the plans were made. Um, at one point, uh, even the city of Poughkeepsie thought it might build a high school there or something like that, which is absolutely crazy because it's not way, way out of town. In any case, the developer then <clears throat> had plans made, and it was at that point uh, when a uh, small group of uh, citizen got together and said, wait a minute. And the plans, however, pa were passed by the, the uh, planning board of uh, the city of Poughkeepsie uh, over against all of these issues that Seeker would have found uh, not. So this nonprofit group sued them on, on the Seeker grounds. It went, uh, however, it went to an appeals court. I mean, it went, if it went to the first uh, judgment and it was denied, and then it went through appeals, you know, obviously, a seeker should be followed and went to appeals. And before it was, because that's when uh, this uh, handshake kind of, well, happened um and uh, it's a win-win for everybody um the developer was able to build his condos on his 20 acres and, and springside landscape restoration was able to uh begin 
uh, restoring and uh, uh, the uh, what was then a pretty much of a wilderness cutting so, down. So half of it did turn into condos after all. He was able to. Uh, he built. He only has only built. But he's <clears throat> able to build seventy five. But he's he was able to build the entire un, number that he wanted <clears throat> on both sides uh, in the one side. And he, you know, design wise, he could he could have done that perhaps, but uh, it has stopped. Uh, there have been on again, off again uh, uh, ideas that he might want to uh, continue building, but you know, uh, the market comes and goes on those kinds of things. So. Uh, uh, the what is the number that is over there? Uh, it's thirty-five or so. So it's but it's not built out at this point. No, 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 it's not built out. No. Hmm. Um, but the the entrance on the way in is taken care of by that. You know, the grass is cut and all that kind of thing. And, but. The gatehouse is the property of his uh, uh, Springside Landscape Restoration, which has been able to get him a couple of different grants for uh, restoring the roof, and painting, and so forth. Thank Great. you. I I've kept you all very long. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the sign of a great program. I wonder, do we have any other questions? I see that we've we've lost Barbara, who has to go on to another another Zoom, so she's a busy lady. But um, I think this has been really great, Harvey, and I'm glad glad you're able to do it for us and um, bring us into your world a little bit, which is a fascinating world with the with the historic landscape and and defending and protecting what we have today, so we're we're very grateful to you for it. We thank you. Okay, <laughs> it's a it is a busy time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so we much. We all are involved. <clears throat> I know we've been waiting for this for a long time. The idea for this talk um, came to me when we had oh, a, a, a talk last year about sort of the natural the natural forests and the ecology of our of our area. And so I, I thought it would be nice to talk a little bit about the the designed landscape and the and the the other side of the same picture. But um so thank you so much and it's great and um hope we can maybe have you back and of course we hope you you will become a member of the Clinton Historical Society as our thank you. So we hope okay. you will Hope you will stick with us as and come to some of our other programs in the future. We'd love to have you with us. But thank you so. Good much. luck on the uh, on the creek. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. We're we're busy at it, and I'm looking forward to at least contacting um, Owen and Linda Clark afterwards here, and we'll talk maybe for a few minutes about our you know the possibility of of an art show, which. It never occurred to me. I never thought we could have access to something so fine. So anyway, but um, thank you, Harvey, and we'll stay in touch. Okay, great. Good night, everyone. Bye. Okay. And um, Owen and Linda, are you still with us? Yeah. Yeah. I see you. <laughs> I mean, I know you're members, so we could we could certainly... <laughs>